pleasure to have you here at Millican and Company showroom in London. My name is Halsey Cook. I'm the CEO of the company, and I'm looking forward to tonight's discussion about how we can accelerate decarbonization and the esteemed panel that we have here. I'm uh, so anxious to hear what you have to say. Um, I'll just uh, maybe kick off the subject a little bit about where we are as a company. Um, about five years ago, we made a declaration that we were going to start uh, publishing a sustainability report, which was not required for the company. We're a 158-year-old privately held company. Um, we're a fifth generation uh, descendants of uh, the original uh, founder of the company, Seth Milliken. Uh, none of the company is in management, but they uh, stay active in terms of uh, what the company stands for. So uh, it, as, a, as a way to kind of begin that journey, we articulated our values for the company uh, and we articulated a purpose statement. Together, we strive to positively impact the world around us for generations to come. And we said that we're about integrity, we're about excellence, we're about innovation, sustainability, and our people. And those five values drive everything we do. And we, we set out to put some goals together for 2025 and try and operationalize these values, which is a difficult thing to do, but we wanted to move from the words to results and change the company, if you will, for the future. So we have 12 goals, which are centered on people, product, and on the planet. And I think as we started that journey and started to create programs around uh, decarbonizing and reducing our, our greenhouse gases, we found that it was a very natural extension that we should make the commitment to net zero by 2050 coming out of the Paris COP. And when we did that, I think, you know, living our values of integrity and excellence, we worried a lot about greenwashing. And it was at that point that the team said, we need to get our plan to net zero approved by the Science-Based Targets Initiative. And so one of the things we're proud of, of is, is that we're one of the first 40 companies on the planet to have our plan um, vetted, and we will report out on that each and every year. Um, so I'll just uh, maybe conclude it there and say, let's jump in on decarbonization um, as the CEO, I believe it not only is a great way for us to live our values, but there are, and we're seeing it unfold around us, existential dangers if we don't pay particular attention to, to carbonization. And I mean, like a long time ago. But what I find very encouraging is, is that we're seeing the problem, but we're also seeing a lot of the solutions at the same time. And the solutions seem to be gaining momentum as we move forward. So um, without further ado, Anne-Marie Angular, who has agreed to be our moderator tonight, is gonna to take us through a discussion here. Uh, she uh, is the uh, managing director for, and senior vice president for EMEA, for the International Well Building Institute, and remains very active um, in uh, making sure that the well AP accreditation process is maintained and uh, supports the industry as a well faculty member as well. She's a veteran of Arab engineering for 11 years where she brought a lot of the sustainability and wellness concepts. Um, and she also has a degree in architecture from uh, New York Institute of Technology. So uh, thank you for joining us tonight and turn the, the panel over to you. Great, thank you all. Sure. <clears throat> Very exciting to be here. Um, it's a it's a real uh, proud moment to be able to have this conversation um, <clears throat> in this location with this Millican family who would feel really passionate about this subject area. So I'm really excited to pull together such an incredibly interesting and diverse panel. So I'm going to do some really quick introductions here um, just to remind everybody what the subject matter is. It's why can't we decarbonize faster? The pathway to net zero in the built environment. And I'd like to start off by introducing Neil Pinnell. So Neil is the Head of Design, Innovation, and Property Solutions at Landsec. Landsec is one of the largest real estate portfolios in Europe, based here in London. <clears throat> uh, 
Neil is also a director at the BCO, which is the British Council of Offices, and is the chair of technical affairs. Thank you, Neil. Um, um, to Neil's right is Mel Allwood. Uh, Mel and I worked together for many years. Mel is the director at Arab, leading the entire sustainability group, which means that she works across sustainability consultants to achieve the sort of low carbon, high impact, high social value buildings and refurbishments. Um, we're also joined by Adam. Adam joins us as a principal from Perkins and Will here in London and really is gonna help us give the perspective of materials, low carbon materials for both global architecture and interior design programs. We have a very interesting guest, Tawny Lonier, who's gonna be giving us a very unique perspective on the economic side of, of this discussion. Um, Tawny joins us from the BDO. They provide advisory and business services to companies in all sectors of the economy. And she's got a special focus on sustainable finance. And we have Geo, Bana Jagger, who is from my team, the IWBI. She's one of our senior account managers dealing with all of our global clients and has a really interesting, also in-depth focus on both sustainability and ESG. I'm very proud to have Maury Lawrence here, who is the Vice President of Sustainability at Milliken and really keen to share what Milliken is doing across these really interesting topics. So we've got about 45 minutes. I'm probably going to have to cut people off every once in a while when we start going over the time. We're going to try and have three interesting conversations, about 15 minutes each. So um, with that, I'm going to kick off with a really interesting summary of a project that Neil has just completed. Um, this is a project called The Forge. The Forge is the UK's first net zero commercial office development. Landsec was awarded funding for the innovative design and groundbreaking construction techniques on this project. Techniques contributed to at least, and you might need to correct me if we're at better stats, 25% reduction in embodied carbon and a savings of 178 tons of steel, which is the equivalent of just under 14 London double-decker buses in weight. So it's a really incredible statistic. I think we all need to hear some really positive news about what's achievable in this world when we're dealing with such a grave topic. So could you tell the audience and, and all of us here like a little bit about that challenge? And this was two years ago, so you were really ahead of your time. And what has it meant for Landsec to be kind of positioning that building? I think the, the forge became, if you like, a focus for our thoughts around innovation and what we we're really looking to do was to combine efficiencies in construction with high performance in terms of operational energy use in buildings into the, the one product if you like that the forge became. So in terms of the operational energy side to some degree there were paths open to us to reposition the building to work as an electric building to use heat pump technology uh, so that we can produce all the heating and cooling requirements of the building from a highly efficient energy source, which also could derive its supply from renewable electricity, So, which we commit to anyway across our portfolio. The, the bigger challenge was to start to really attack the embodied carbon. And as we move forward where our infrastructure becomes decarbonised, the, the relevance of the carbon that you spending creating buildings or modernizing changing buildings in the first place and actually through their life cycle you know, the world of refits becomes a much more important part going forward in terms of minimizing the carbon footprint of the built environment sector so here it was about trying to drive efficiency trying to drive productivity and construction and to learn the lessons from other industries so what i looked into was a uh, thing called Design for Manufacturer Assembly, which has been used very successfully in manufacturing, where there's continuous improvement in the way you go forward when you try and um, deliver things that are built much more effectively with lower waste streams and bring them into a, a construction environment, which is uh, very alien to many of those aspects, which is very much a, a bespoke cottage industry on steroids sometimes, responding to a lot of creative input from the designers, but up, and, and ultimately satisfying those requirements, but not necessarily in an efficient way. And I think the, the sort of learnings from that manufacturing industry is the high efficiency that you can apply to it. And when you apply efficiency, 
that's often at the base of good sustainability thinking. And so we were able to reduce the amount of material that we use. We were able to focus on the way that the designs were brought together to integrate the process and minimize our use of resources, which led us to be a, to really position the building to meet as probably the, the most defined, uh, let's say, a carbon target at the moment in the marketplace, which was the framework from um, the Green Building Council, UK Green Building Council. So the combination of that operational carbon effectively moving it to a position of net zero, minimizing the embodied carbon by building very efficiently and using materials that were lower carbon input. In fact, the raised floor is actually uh, a reused product, a sort of pre look product. So again, minimizing that carbon footprint and finally just offsetting what was left um, with gold standard offsets. So that gave us compliance with that framework and enabled us to put into the marketplace both our first net zero carbon building, I think the first one that had qualified its design under that framework process. I know Adam, you spent a lot of time on the Perkins and Will side with, with this idea that selecting material is one of your lowest hanging fruit. And could you talk to us a little about what that's been like for the for Perkins and Will to kind of establish this, you know, selection process? Uh, difficult. <laughs> I think, I mean, one of the problems we find is there's so many different like targets and metrics and beliefs. And so, you know, when you're, you know, there's 70 in our team trying to instill like consistently and what we think good practice is or what a good product looks like is, is really mm. like, you can spend a lot of time and effort on just that rather than the actual specification or the creative input side of things. And so trying to like remove the friction and the complex complexity of getting to good specifications is a big part of our job is how do we make it easy for people to make the right decisions. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the key things that we're really struggling with now is really the movement from, from new to, to reuse or pre-loved, as Neil put it, products, mm -hmm. like how we can find the right balance between specification of, of new, you know, high quality, highly yeah, positively sustainable products with products which have come have already been created and don't require you know virgin material extraction mm -hmm. and you know and so that you know, there's a lot of great products on the market that are sustainable products and people can obviously they'll be leading in that and and so that's kind of one side of thing of the thing but developing a market for second life products is really where we've been emphasizing a lot of our time you know, we we sort of feel as architects, you know, we can only get so involved in the operational energy side of things, but the the embodied energy, the embodied carbon is really where a lot of our focus is. Yeah, you know, and I like to think operational energy is like a science, lots of numbers and figures and data about energy use, the consumption that an office building has. But embodied carbon is like an art, like it requires much more kind of like creative non-lateral thinking about how we can really drive down the embodied carbon in, in physical things. Um, and so a lot of our time is on that, but we've sort of started to kind of move away from worrying about specification and thinking about process because, you know, specifying good products is, is important, but how can we as a, as a global business really influence the process of design and construction? That's really where, we'll, that's really where we're going to get much greater benefits over a period of time. Um, and we've been lucky to work on some really great projects. We're currently working on JLL's headquarters at the moment, and their you know their push is for it to be the most sustainable fit out in the in the world. And they've got really high targets on reduction of embodied carbon. And so for that, we have to just think about reuse as well as thinking about specifying new things. Wow, really impressive. And and Mel, from your perspective at Arab, are you is this a push or a pull? Are clients really pushing the boundaries, or is Arab as usual kind of trying to set? the limit of what people should be looking at. It's it, it's absolutely a push for clients. I mean, the, the landscape in the last 18 months, two years, has absolutely changed to a point where you know, we, we are no longer having to push doors open to say, listen to me. We, 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 we're managing the intensity with which people are responding to it. You know, that, that, that doesn't mean that change is happening mm -hmm. as fast as we need it to. It takes us, you know, it takes us seven to 10 years to design and deliver it over a building we, we we can't make a change overnight and and that time scale means that we are you know we're always struggling with the overlap between the speed with which our clients expectations change and the and, and the fact that quite often we're working on projects that maybe we started seven eight years ago and that sets a real challenge for mm -hmm. us there's, there's no point in complaining about that that's 
That's what we have to manage and deal with. And the challenge that that sets for us is um, saying, you know, how, not how can we respond to what our clients' questions are now, but how can we prepare ourselves and our clients for the questions that they may be asking us in seven or eight years' time when we begin to start to put these projects in the market? How can we make sure that our projects are ready then for the expectations that they're going to have? So, you know, it's a, these are exciting times. It's... It is hard, but these are the battles we want to be fighting. So, Maury, I would imagine you've got quite a bit of experience, like to be able to provide guidance on the supply chain conversations and just Milliken's position of getting to net zero. What would you like to to tell aspiring architects and designers about how you guys are going to help us make that easier? Well, first, congratulations on the forge. Thank you. And that's wonderful. We need we all need examples of how it can be done. And we echo what we're hearing from each of you in that it's time for scale, it's time for momentum, it's, it's challenging. Milliken's approach has been to listen, to support what our customers are asking for, and also to rally around acting what's right for humankind. So while we had our 2025 goals, when the SBTI standard came out for net zero, we said, is that enough? They were scope one and two. We've heard you all say you really have to look at embodied carbon, and we knew we needed to look at all scopes. And we knew we needed to continue to create momentum. So we said, are we doing enough? And with the standard out, we went ahead and knew we needed to look at all of our scopes, account for them, and set aggressive net zero targets for 2030. Um, and to try to create consistency, we've heard from our own teams, we hear quite a lot. Yes, there's a lot out there about carbon, but it's quite confusing. Embodied carbon, LCA carbon, net zero, net zero for a building, net zero for a company. So I think one of our challenges is how do we create this action with clarity and transparency when it's really complicated? And that's something we'll all have to do together. So I think we're gonna, we're gonna pivot a little bit from this conversation. So I think we've set a really good foundation, but I would love to hear from Geo first in terms of, you know, we're talking about, you know, very much focused on design, built environment outcomes, but there's, there's another side to this, which is the economics and the, and the ESG performance. And I know that your focus has always been on the ROI of social materiality um, indicators. And I think that will dovetail really nicely into Tony's uh, position here again about sustainable finance. So how do, you, how do you help keep the alignment of the conversation that's strictly design, built environment related but at the same time, try and understand that there's a social materiality conversation here happening. Mm -hmm. and, and ESG has had its, uh, it continues to, you know, require people to do a significant amount of transparency and reporting. Yeah. You know, I find uh, the topic super interesting because in reality, what makes a building, the built environment, an effective environment is the people. So the importance of that aspect, and yeah, you're right, is a passion of mine to make sure that we're considering both people and planning when we're looking at strategies and reporting and how we move towards the right uh, strategy for reporting. And that comes back to the asset management and asset owners into their ROI. The question we get asked regularly is, what does it mean to invest in a well product? What does it mean to be part of the well family membership? What does it mean? It means that we're considering that aspect as well as everything else. Earlier we were touching on the disaggregation, so many distractions, so much. What do we focus on? How do we report? And then you have to consider materials and all the things that are coming up. All of those end up costing a lot. And then when we look at sustainable finance, which uh, Tony will be able to guide us a bit more on, we'll, this is where you see the gap. And this is where people, I think, pause and think, I don't know how to do this. The investment is just too great and it's not helping anybody. In reality, it is because we're making progress and we're seeing excellent examples. But we do need to standardize a lot of the work we're doing and the alignment to regulation, legislation and other frameworks doesn't help, but I think we're coming together. I mean, the next couple of days will teach us a lot as well into what's happening. Uh, but overall, I think if we hadn't started the effort, I know the journey has been difficult, you've lived it as much as many of us, but we're making progress. And I think the conversation, from my point of view, in the only 10 years I've had in sustainability, it seems a bit more educated, a bit more um, focused on initiatives and delivery, better alignment to reporting, which means you can start to focus on materials and plan, which means we're heading, I think, the right 
in the right direction towards sustainable finance, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. I think, Tony might correct me, she might say, no, we're not there yet. <laughs> but I think it's you know, heading that way. What we also hear a lot from our financial institution members is that they look at us to help them assess how to best place um, sustainable bonds, green bonds, and all that kind of things that are more relevant to them. So that means we need to translate our efforts into their world. And I think it's your turn to educate us a bit more. <laughs> well, you can ask for a question from Anne Marie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you definitely helped. Uh, I think you're going to help us kind of understand that really interesting economic nuance and, and really mm -hmm. understanding if decarbonization targets in general in the built environment align with industry and organizational growth plans. Like, how do those work together? And and then, you know, we know there's looming targets on the SDGs. You know, that is a very um, prominent set of guidelines that companies around the world are really aligning themselves with. So where do you see the, uh, like we just said, the investment potential and the alignment with having to meet these targets and the growth that that company needs to achieve? Um, being in such an illustrious company here, I mean, I'm, I'm not an engineer. I don't work in the built environment. I'm just a backroom boffin that is very, very focused on sustainable finance. But um, I guess bringing it back to what is the question we're trying to answer today? And it's why not decarbonize faster? And I have to say that probably the fi financial side of things is has not been helpful in doing that. It's because investors try very, very hard to find ways not to invest in these types of things. But with the changes in legislation and regulation, it's forcing some recalcitrant companies coming together and saying, this is what we're doing. And we have to start doing the reports. We have to start making those targets and measuring those things. But investing is not about picking the winners, it's about avoiding the losers. And how do you avoid the losers? By making sure that you understand that the company looks at the risks in their entirety and how does that impact their growth? Because you are investing in their growth. You're not investing just in them. You're investing in how are they going to grow, not only their company, but how does the company grow within the industry and with the environment, much more broadly in the environment. So some of these things that I've been hearing today, and I think it's, it's really, really positive, is that sustainable finance can only go as fast as the slowest actor. You know, because they are... They are investing other people's money. So they're, they're, by their very nature, they're not forward leaning finance. But on a flip, uh, they, must, they are expecting now companies to have a net zero plan. It is no longer, oh, I have this net zero plan and aren't I fabulous and look at this shiny thing that I just put together. It's now talking about if you don't have a net zero plan or decarbonization plan, you are then a pariah. You're, you're being pushed then to the edges. But understanding the sustainability risk, understanding the ESG, and I use those two things in different ways. ESG is about metrics, it's about measuring, and sustainability is about the process. How do you become sustainable? So when you're an investor, you're looking at what is the growth of the company and what is the resiliency of that company? And in order to do that, you have to understand where is the data coming from, but you also have to understand is how does that company fit within their growth plans, within the industry, and within themselves, because that's what they're investing in. So if we get back to why not carbonize faster, I would probably say that sustain, the sustainable finance or finance itself has not been a huge advocate for going faster because they don't go very fast at all. But with the increasing uh, quality of the data that's coming out, mm -hmm. I, I think that we are going to see an increased quickness because we have regulation and legislation. The recalcitrant companies are, trying, are starting to think, oh, how can I comply? And they're doing these things. I mean, there's... Rarely is there a landscape like that's looking so much further in the, in the future that says, oh my God, this is a shining, a shining light on the top of the hill. You guys did a green bond. It was, it yeah, was we did brilliantly, this one, this one, this yeah, it was brilliantly um, uh, uh, embraced by the financial community. And green bonds themselves have gone up like gangbusters in the last half year. Yeah. Why? It's because companies are, because investors are starting to see, we have the data now, we can then put it on our own models and we can figure out how yeah. are you managing risk? What yeah. is it about resilience? How are you making sure that you're adaptive? Yeah. So Neil, tell us about the, the fund, the retrofit fund. Well, I guess it's a, it all fits together in that overall plan. I think you said that Millikan have sort of embraced the SPR targets and we did the same. I think we were the first real estate company to set a target based on the science-based input back in 2016. 
And then that sets you on a trajectory and you have to start to plan on how you are going to achieve your goals. Uh, we adjusted that target after the COP to make it one and a half degree alignment. Uh, and we've actually adjusted again because the recent changes require much more scope three emissions to be included in those targets. So we, we'd originally set our target to, to get to a net zero organization by 2030, and we've had to revise that to 2040, but we've kept all the targets that we had for 2030 in any case around energy and the buildings. And I've talked about the forge, which I think is a shining example of what you can do in a new build with real um, efficient, efficiency-led, design-led thinking that's thinking about how you make the products that are going to be used and how you put them together in an efficient and effective way. But that's all about the, the new product, if you like, we're putting into our portfolio, which needs to be net zero from the get-go, or else we're just giving ourselves a bigger challenge with our wider mm -hmm. portfolio, which we've also got to reposition. And that's important to maintain our competitive position in the marketplace. More and more organisations now are looking to take the best real estate that they can in terms of its performance and all other aspects, but increasingly now they're asking the question about where it sits in terms of its carbon positioning. And I'm pleased to say on the forge, our first occupier that signed up um, is actually a, a carbon company, carbon clean. And so we've attracted a lot of companies that are really looking at their own businesses and want to be associated with a with a building that's got huge credibility. So that is a market factor. It mm -hmm. puts us in a, in a competitive advantage when we're competing against others for those same customers. And but we can't afford that our, our portfolio, which is the bulk of our investment, to just sit there and gradually fall into obsolescence. So we need to reposition it. So again, um, I think we're the first company to actually put a fund together uh, within the business, 135 million, to reinvest back into those assets, to reposition them to decarbonize them. And we're using various approaches, um, air source heat pumps to replace fossil fuel burning on site for heating, uh, big investments in large scale PV, just getting the BMS systems to work better and then looking at how AI can maybe help to supercharge that once we've got them to the best place they can be. And importantly, working with our customers to try and get them to work with us and, and look at the behaviors and how people use buildings, because that's equally important. And, when you start modeling the performance of, of energy and use, you really need to understand how your building is going to work, but how really people are going to use the building. And that all needs to come together to put us in the position that we're aiming for. But I think if we position ourselves in that way, then hopefully like-minded companies that, that need real estate solutions will look to us as one of the their first choice providers. And that gives us, hopefully, a sustainable business model going forward, which is really important. May I just add something to this uh, memory? What I love about the solution is that you are looking to solve more than one thing at one time. Yeah. When I first started 30 years ago, it was like, we focus on climate change. That's all we do. We'd have one solution. And now a lot of companies are moving to say, if we can solve this, this is also solved and this can be solved and this can yeah. be. So finding a portfolio of solutions, but acting once and, and having the and a different solutions, which is yeah. incredibly powerful. So you have... Uh, the social side of things as well, you know, yeah, how is yeah. the building used and then how is the building built yeah. and then how will the building, what is its what its end life look like as well? Yeah, and, and we can't ignore, you know, people, uh, what makes our business ultimately and it's people that use buildings. So, you know, investing in people may realise their potential working with the communities that we work with, we take that all seriously too. So we have a social fund, we, we want to help give people opportunities in life and also to create solutions for people, whether it's places to, to shop, to work, to live, uh, to enjoy their leisure time. So the, the company has an holistic vision and we are trying to fulfill that. It's not easy. I think you said there is a lot of challenges, and particularly mm. in the world of embodied carbon, because it, it isn't as scientifically rigorous, certainly not yet, compared to operational carbon. But you've got to start somewhere and you need mm -hmm. to push and we actually that's why we need the cooperation of manufacturers i think and suppliers to help in that area to actually give us accurate assessments of what their products contain and how that sits in terms of a carbon equation and Laurie, how did you find the like the focus on renewable energy targets as a as a business from milligan across retail manufacturing what kind of a challenge was that to be able to address well, I'd like to say it's easy, but that's not true. All of these have trade-offs and complexities. 
<laughs> but for sure, when we set renewable energy, our first renewable energy target in 2018, the one beauty of setting a goal is that teams mobilize and you surprise yourself on what you can achieve together. So we've been able to achieve that initial target of increasing our renewable energy to 100,000 megawatt hours per year. And then obviously to hit our net zero goals, we require much more renewable energy, not just for our operations, which is critical. We wanna focus on what we can control, meaning our manufacturing sites, our showrooms, where we operate, but then we need to impact where we influence. So our supply chain, both up, to, up and down the supply chain, but specifically on renewable energy at our operations, now we're dependent. Climate change is a collective action issue. So policy really matters in terms of bringing the grid and making sure the infrastructure is put in place. So we're active in that front. We also have been active in investing in renewable energy, both solar and credits. And of course, we're very active in looking at on-site solar, on-site type ways to expand renewable energy so that we can meet these aggressive 2030 targets, which include reducing our scope one and two by 50%. But that means we need the solutions there that are both sustainably attractive and financially attractive. And that will take all of us for sure yeah. to continue to push forward. Well, as we talk about, you know, difficult metrics to achieve, I think Mel, it'd be interesting to hear your perspective from Eric's point of view, you know, we have multiple metrics and rating systems that are out there um, that are supposed to help really guide the conversation. Um, how do you think that these key metrics are helping or are we still devoid of, of some clarity, whether it's net zero as a definition or sustainability targets or the alignment of sustainability targets and net zero definitions? What's your take on that? I think we are moving, you know, we are moving very fast in terms of those definitions and in terms of understanding what we're, we're trying to achieve. I think we are becoming much more articulate in in defining what it is we're trying to do, and we're becoming much better at setting targets that will help us achieve that. And I, you know, I think that situation has changed very much. I think it's really important for us to always be clear about what the target is trying to achieve. So, for example, the renewable energy energy target is a really great example. Um, what we're trying to do there is not maximise the amount of PV panels that are built. We're trying to use that as a lever to minimise demand so that we can meet the, meet the reductions that we have with, the, with what we have available. Um, and I think it's important for us as a, as a community to make sure that, that we keep the pressure on being articulate about what we're trying to achieve and to constantly check back with ourselves to make sure that the targets that we're setting are, are the right targets to achieve the outcome that we want to achieve. Sometimes I think we lose, you know, we all lose touch with that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I think when we have um, a complexity of a number of different targets, it, it really forces us to do, to, to take that step backwards and say, um, what else are we going to gain when we meet this target? And why do we need to do those two things at once? And I think the, the wellbeing piece is a really good example in buildings. Um, absolutely, we're trying to deliver low carbon buildings. But there's no point if we deliver buildings that people don't want to be in. Mm -hmm. a, a low carbon building that makes people unhappy is a sustainability mm -hmm. fail. Yeah. And that's a really good example for me of where it's really important for us to have two quite different targets. One about how do we drive towards net zero, and the second about how do we make sure that these are really healthy, thriving buildings that people want. Mm -hmm. So there's a limit to how simple we can make it, mm -hmm. I think is the answer. It's a really interesting perspective, and I know, Adam, you're probably looking at this from recycling material, circular economy. You know, we talked about these various materials and products that are coming back into the industry and having a second life. What do you think, what processes need to happen to make that more mainstream? Um, well, I think, I mean, what I, I like to say recycling is bad. You know, and I know people like tell me off for saying that, but I think that is a, that is a kind of mind. When I was at school, we used to draw pictures of recycling, and that was great, right? But actually, recycling is not the answer. It, it is quite bad. We need to move beyond recycling. Of course, there is a place for recycling, and there is some good recycling, but a lot of recycling that happens in this country is it just gets shipped to another country, or we just burn it, and that's not recycling. And so, I think you know, I think there's some mindset shift in you know the kind of general public about. We need to move beyond recycling being any sort of a solution. And so for me, the barrier really is, you know, is around manufacturers and, you know, 
I spend a lot of time with, say, furniture manufacturers, and what I say to them is, I want to go into a showroom and I want to, I want to have the opportunity to buy new product, to buy second life products from directly from manufacturers. In the same way that if I went into a Patagonia store, I could buy new or second life apparel, and you know, I think Patagonia have done some really great things in terms of pushing the needle on reuse. Um, and I, I don't think at, at the moment the reuse industry and construction is kind of third party people. So for example, the race access floor, for example, the new use is a great product. Race access floors are in our calculations, the largest contributor to body carbon in a fit out. So if, even if you can use second life for race access floor, you've already, you've already done a good job. Um, but it's third party organizations who are intermediary in that process. And so I, you know, I really believe until manufacturers, people who make products really get behind putting in place systems where they can develop second life products out of their own loop, that's always going to be a barrier. You know, I, I want to go and see people who are making stuff and be given the choice between new, which is often the right solution and products, which have, which have come from a second or a more circular stream. Um, so, you know, I think there's very few manufacturers across all of the different packages within the construction industry who are really embracing that as a business model. And, you know, I appreciate that it's a messy, complex, probably not very profitable business model to start off with, but at some point it will become a much bigger part of their business. And, you know, the, the race access, for example, is used a lot, but it's a good example because the company that do it now, it's one company who are kind of leading that. They had no business for ages. It's had loads of race access for and nobody wanted to buy it. And now they haven't got enough race access for <laughs> So, you know, them, and I, it's, I think it's, a t it's been a 10 year journey from them from thinking that this is a good idea to anyone wanting, wanting it, <laughs> to it becoming a problem of supply. And so it is a 10 year, it's a 10 year journey for people to go from, from the niche of reuse to a strong business case. Um, but I, you know, I truly believe that if, you, if you're not an offer that service in the future, you know, you, people won't be coming to you. Um, so, you know, for me, manufacturers really getting on board with understanding how they can offer alternatives to new products is going to be the game changer for us to make the big changes. Adam, I, I couldn't support you more. It's, what's really interesting about that is that what, what is really beginning to emerge with that kind of 10 year journey, which absolutely we, we, we see that completely um, from, from, from other perspectives, is that the barriers to, to doing that reuse piece, so often we've got enmeshed in the idea that those are technical barriers. But as you say, that most of the barriers to doing this are, are not technical barriers at all. But yes. Sometimes we need to test them in ways to understand what they can do with them. But so many of the barriers are around, you know, can we achieve a warranty? Where are we going to store this? Yeah, logistics. Who is going to pay to move it around? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who's going to deal with security and insurance? How do we, how do we uh, uh, collect the data to, to allow us to understand what the gap is between supply and demand? Um, and I think the shift that's been happening is that we're really beginning to set that those are one-off problems. Those are actually the environment that we have to solve in order yes. to mm -hmm. unlock this this reuse piece. Because absolutely, we can't. We we need to shift to a reuse model and not always. And when when people say those things to me, those barriers, I say to them, if you're going to extract something out of the ground and make something, you have to go through a warranty process. You have to get the logistics. Mm -hmm. So people are doing that, but they're just taking from the natural environment as opposed to, you know, the idea of urban mining, which is like, everything we need is here. Mm -hmm. Everything we need to build another building is within EC1. If we could just access it appropriately and process it appropriately. No. So we already do it for new stuff. Mm -hmm. We can apply that same thinking mm -hmm. for old stuff, but this isn't the margin <laughs> financially on it, mm -hmm. which, is, which is a different problem. It's the education piece that we're going through. You just said 10 years and so on. I've always said sustainability requires an aggressive and ambitious strategy with yeah. very soft landing. Because by its own, in, by nature, it needs to be inclusive, which means you need to educate all the people. You know, there's a great mind that once said, "It's not easy being green," <laughs> but I, and it's not. That doesn't mean it's impossible. Yeah. But now we're starting to show the journeys. We're probably at different stages of that journey, and the industries in at different stages. What I'm starting to see, though, the uh, ability we have to influence the sustainable finance is going to cost them a bit more at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. But like you said, it's not an option anymore. We're going into that world 
where we're going to be short of new items for different mm -hmm. reasons, mm -hmm. yeah. not just in the interior, but the construction, all those things, but innovation will happen when people relax a little bit more about that in terms of the strategy set, we can now start to soft land those ideas and implement and work together. But collaboration has never been stronger from all angles. Yeah, that no, I, I agree. See. I agree. But I mean, I mean, I do feel that the barrier to accelerate decarbonisation is money. Like it's, it's still more expensive. My belief is it's still more expensive to deliver a meaningfully sustainable building or interior than it is to yes. deliver a non-sustainable building. And that's generally around economies of scale. So until, in, you know, so when we're working with clients who want a fundamentally sustainable project, we say, let's just hope it costs the same as it would have done if we, if we did for everything high, high value, high end new. That, that's, our, that's our financial kind of like barrier for the project. Let's set a budget which is high quality, high end, everything new. Can we then deliver a sustainable project within that, within that price point? Within, <laughs> yeah, can we get a carbon budget that aligns with that financial budget? Obviously not everyone can afford that type of spend. And so until it's, until it's no less expensive to, to deliver sustainable as it is to deliver a kind of standard project, mm. it's always going to give clients, you know, kind of like difficult decisions to be made. Mm until they start to get penalized for their carbon footprints as businesses and therefore their carbon footprint is going to be a kind of taxable aspect of their business mm -hmm. it will then be cheaper to, de to deliver a more sustainable environment because they'll save money on that yeah, penalization absolutely. and until that happens it's still really hard for companies to decide to spend more money for a sustainable solution well i think i definitely think that maury's probably got some answers because she's been through the process of trying to find materials that are more circular and i know that Milliken is really aggressively looking at take back products and being able to really understand that it's not going to be easy to get the product back and take off the adhesives, but it's definitely possible. And we hear you, Adam, you're making a call to action for manufacturers on reuse and not just recycling. And certainly Milliken believes that advancing circularity is necessary to decarbonization. They're intertwined, gets back to systems thinking. We can't only focus on solving for one, there are many levers, not just renewable energy, but also mindset shifts on how we view resources altogether. So um, Milliken is very much aligned in working on delivering solutions across our both our products and our operations and how we train and work with our, with our people. I do think there's this critical component in addition to material use and how we view circularity and carbon that ties into, yes, data is important. Yes, these targets are important. We might come back to that. But this notion of social sustainability, how you put people at the center of the decarbonization conversation, I think will also accelerate because it's very hard for many to understand even what we're talking about or what the choices are outside of it's more expensive. However, if we make it an issue about safety and we start to really understand all the ways when you're looking at finance that risk and opportunities come up when you're really looking at biodiversity and climate and air quality and your ability to enjoy a building or a green space near it or feel safe in it or get to it, um, there's a very critical notion we all need to get better at in making social sustainability not over here separate and only about necessarily training or classical definitions of social, but how do social and planet intertwine inextricably so that we can advance material change conversations so that everyone understands the beauty of reuse. It's not a second choice, it could be a primary choice. You know, that mindset shift is really critical to putting people first. Mm -hmm. And at Milliken, we do. We report on people first in our strategy and in our report. We talk about putting people first. We want to engage our people and engage our supply chains and customers. And I think all of us need to figure out how better to unlock that. It's not, we can't bring everyone in through the data and metrics, but if we make it personal and we make it uh, real to them, then we'll help accelerate. I think Landsec has also looked at social value as an, as an outcome and potentially using the social value portal. Is that one of the tools that you're all using or is the BCO also helping to kind of as a social value tool? Um, I think the you know, guy, well, who um, helps the sustainability uh, group within the BCO and he's very much in that space and has worked hard uh, to create social value solutions that I think a lot of local authorities are using as well as clients. So yes, we, we've done that. We've done impact reports as well to understand what is the wider footprint 
impact of what we do when we develop buildings or refurbish and extend their life. Um, so I, I think that it is a holistic picture. There isn't just one thing that you, you need to do. I think that the, you know, there's a big responsibility, I think, with designers as well, because if, if I look back to the example of the forge, yes, that was a new building, but the, the thinking in terms of driving efficiencies meant that we used a lot less material, you know, we took a whole a chunk of uh, steel out of the building, we used less concrete, we used more sustainable concrete, but we also, there was just good design thinking that went into it, the original design of the building before I sort of took it over as a sort of innovation project and we, we started to look at how to drive efficiencies. We significantly reduced the basement by about 50% in terms of uh, area, about 70% by volume, which meant we were excavating less and we were putting less material into the ground to create space mm -hmm. and yet we were still providing the same product in terms of area, in fact a little bit more because mm -hmm. we worked hard on the efficiency of the building. So I think, you know, designers have really got to step up to the mark in terms of how they design things. And to look at more standardisation approach we go forward, the other part of DFMA is to look at things of kits of parts which others can use. So, and if you then create more standardised components that are used in construction, buildings when they are ultimately disassembled, you get the parts back again. And if, mm -hmm. if with the technology that we've got that we can track the life cycle of those products, then you're in a position to be able to make that next use of them so much more easier than it is now. Um, we're already seeing, you know, the example of the raised floor is one example. Another example, steel is a very energy intensive product. Um, and there are one or two steel stockers now in the UK that are starting to curate spaces to, to gather together steel that's removed from, from buildings that are being deconstructed and are refurbishing that and putting that back into the marketplace. Mm. And now, because everybody's really targeting low embodied carbon solutions, um, getting your hands on some elements of steel that are effectively wiped off your balance sheet because you're reusing them mm -hmm. is a major win. But trying to get the right sizes is, is challenging because you're working with a back catalogue that was never thought through to be used in that way, but our front catalogue can be. So as we go forward, we can make that process easier in the future. So there's, there's responsibilities on everybody, I think, in, in the whole Eco structure of the built environment from clients, mm. setting themselves the targets and, and pushing themselves to, to make a difference in the way that they behave, but also then the response from the designers, from the tractors, and from the supply chain, so manufacturers key within that to provide the right solutions and to do the thinking that's needed to enable the future to be much more sustainable in the past. You know what I'm hearing here, somebody that's not doesn't work in the built environment is I'm hearing the fifth dimension. To me, the fifth dimension is about imagination. You know, you have the mm -hmm. fourth dimension, fourth being time, but the fifth is about imagination. And what I'm hearing here from this round table is about imagination, how to be creative, how to be innovative. So it's not about the targets. Mm -hmm. It's not about recycling, but it's about, we know that we have planetary boundaries. Mm -hmm. We know that we're dealing with these restrictions. Mm -hmm. How can we be innovative? And I liked your point when it comes to thinking about the social sustainability, humans are amazing at being adaptive. So even if it's gonna go up by three degrees, I guarantee you somebody will adapt to that, right? But what we're trying to do here is saying, we're comfortable with how it is, we know how it works, let's be innovative, let's be use our imagination to actually maintain how it is here for future generations, which is the Millican way, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that was, you were the first person to kick off what I think is the, the, the sort of final round of give me something positive to say. And I thought that was really well said, that this is about an imagination. The next series of solutions is going to really come from systems thinking, being able to really challenge the, uh, the expected way of doing design. So I'm going to give everybody a minute to think. Um, let's close this out with something positive, reasons to believe that this, even though we know it's challenging, even though it's, it's an uphill battle, give us um, a word or two or a sentence about what's positive way to end this. So, Gio, can you kick us off? Sure. I think uh, what I'm hearing in terms of going into a slightly different industry from sustainability as well, the real estate, the construction side of the, the world and all that, is that I hear that people really want to have, do better. 
And we have, from one side, we have the frameworks and standards and certifications and all the things that are telling us you should do it this way. We have regulation legislation coming in hard. We have no time. But we have the opportunity to come together and start to innovate knowing what we know. So if we all focus on what we know and deliver that piece, I guarantee we're going to make progress and we're going to be amazed at when we look at the reports in April next year in 2025, how much progress we've made because I think the momentum is here. Mm -hmm. We just can't drop that, you know, and continue. Mm -hmm. It's not easy being green, but let's go for it. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking about how to, I mean, I just read a book by the guy that started Patagonia. I use that as again. He basically said, like, once you, once you accept that we're fucked, then you can just be, you can just then, you can just like, then you can really think about what's next. And, you know, we, we are a bit fucked. And I, I think probably everyone in this room realizes that. I don't think enough people outside of this room realize that. But once you say, you know, that that's happened, we've done it, we've, you know, our generations have created this problem. We're not, you know, small things are not going to make a difference anymore. We have to make big things, big, big steps, big changes, you know, sort of um, institutional systematic changes are mm. what's going to make any sort of difference. I think that once you understand that, it really is free and, and you know, linked mm -hmm. to that imagination thing. And I think the other thing that I'm, you know, um, excited by, I've got two small kids, you know, and so part of, you want your kids to have had some sort of the luck of the world that we've had is, you know, the, you know, we talk a lot about audiences and, you know, the audiences that we talk to, you know, our demographic, the people who are now run, starting to run real estate companies, the people who are now becoming accountants, the people who are now using our buildings, they really care in a way that, the way that my generation and older generations didn't really care. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they celebrate this idea that we call a new beauty, which is like when you look at a building or a space, you're looking at the values beyond the aesthetic. And I think, you know, you, before there was always values around efficiency and those sort of things, but actually you know, the purpose of a building, the, where it's come from, the social value, the fact that it might not be perfect, but there's real reasons behind that. Um, we understand that those audiences really care and believe in that and that they will be driving what we will do in the future. And that they'll be our clients or they already are our clients um and so that really gives me you know kind of like a lot of a lot of kind of stimulus and hope you asked me about the sdgs and uh i didn't really touch on those so please forgive me Michael. but with the changing demographics if the sdgs are going to be delivered they're going to have to be delivered by cities and part of the city environment of course is the built mm -hmm. environment so the built environment is seen as this object, object, but actually it is an integral part of delivering some, you know, these 17 goals that we have that have been identified as the world's largest challenges. So SDGs on one side, there's a big, huge challenge, but if I'm listening here, then we have a very good way to make sure that cities are part of a solution, an innovative solution, than uh, holding people back. Great, Neil? Well, I think the good thing is, I think we, we have the tools to do what we need to do. You know, I'm, my profession as an engineer and engineer is, engineering is the appliance of science. I think the science has put all the tools out there. For, we now need to use our knowledge and engineering skills to, to develop the future of real estate such that it delivers the sustainable spaces that we need. Um, both my children have gone into um, an engineering world, um, slightly different routes, or one's working for Historic Scotland, perhaps helping to preserve the past. Mm. And my daughter, so my son and my daughter works um, in central London, helping to develop new buildings and major refurbishments of buildings. So they're both taking that sort of thinking forward into what they do. So I think the future is obviously young people and the way that they really relate to the environment that we're in. But the responsibility, I think, relies with the older generations who got us to where we are now and have a responsibility to make sure that we push forward at all the aspects that we've talked about today to try and make the world a better place. Yeah, similar probably. No, absolutely not on the plane, the scale of the challenge that, that we have, have ahead of us and, and that every day that, that, that mountain gets a steep one to climb. But also every day I walk into rooms full of people, you know, my colleagues, our collaborators, our peers, our clients. Um, and I look around rooms and I think, you know, we've got all the we've got all the right brains here. If this room room full of people can't solve this. You know, every day you walk into a room and there's a, a different mix of people who give you new perspectives, new passion, um, 
just ways of thinking and doing and actually making change happen in a, in a way that is, you know, it's, it's really different than what has changed, I think. It's, now's the time. Well, the point you made earlier, the buildings have got to work. Mm -hmm. It's no good building things that don't work because that wastes all the carbon. Yeah. We, we did that in the 70s you know, and we can't afford to do that again. So they have to be good and I think that's why, you know, the, the world accreditations is a good thing because it balances all those things to ensure that we create good environments. But this is against the engineer's credo, isn't it? Engineer's credo. You know, if, if you build something it doesn't work, suddenly if that engineer you take it away from you, right? I know, well, I've always had a different perspective in the way that I've approached it in terms of, you know, I saw the lessons from what happened at that, that period of time and you just think, what a waste, you know. Mm -hmm. We need to put our effort into creating things that work. Simple. What a waste of resource, but also what a waste of time and what a waste of goodwill. Yeah. We, we need, we need to be better. Yes. But you know, I think we see you know, I think we see that with Millican as well. Like, you know, absolutely we have the passion about creating a circular product. But you also want everybody to walk into a room with your product and say, This great space. Uh, great space. Yes. So that's that's a no compromise, isn't it? So yes. We, we cannot afford to absolutely that didn't deliver a lesser product that's, that's, that doesn't meet the bar. Mm -hmm. So Warren, maybe you can close us out from this conversation and decided mm -hmm. that tomorrow you're going to get to attend a really important event, the Reuters event, and maybe there's a bit of just summary of how Milligan's really looking forward and giving us some really good reasons to believe. Of course, each of you gave reasons to believe, so thank you, and thanks for moderating. I think companies play a role. And at Milliken, we say, together we strive to positively impact. And it's true. So maybe I'll just give a few examples just from today to make it very real about what gives us optimism. First, conversations like this, coming together across functions and professions to have important dialogue. And as you mentioned, our CEOs here to have conversations with over a 1,000 people on how to scale decarbonization faster. So you have your top leader committed to those conversations. Then I met a Millican team member, Louise, never met her to, before, met her today, and she's a sustainability champion. She leads sustainability education. She's gotten additional education this year, so she has more um, accreditation when she goes to our customers and credibility. And that's all on her own. Solutions come from everywhere. And in my email inbox, another Millican associate emailed me and said, Mari, in our operations, we figured out a way to reuse carpet scraps in a unique new way that we're looking at. And so operational solutions. And that's what, that's what you need. You need everybody's action to matter and be in the game. And you also need to find hope in daily actions, too, because it's um, a massive problem to solve an opportunity but there are signs of progress, and um, tonight has been that too. And we do look forward to the conference discussion tomorrow. So thanks for mentioning that. Great. Thank you, everybody. It's a great conversation. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And Marie, thank you for moderating. To, to the whole panel, uh, I talked initially about trying to operationalize our values. And uh, I see such evidence of that here. And um, these issues are gonna outlive all of our careers, but uh, it's very, very heartening and encouraging to see so much progress and, and uh, attention and, and intellectual and um, energy uh, being put into it. So thank you Great. for thank you. It was doing such a nice job for us. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you everyone.